Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. In this special crossover episode, join me and Mike Karate of A History of Italy as we turn back the clock to 1492 and Christopher Columbus, who sailed the ocean blue during the exciting age of exploration. I hope you enjoy part two of this discussion. Let's step back to the second half of the first millennium. My audience know how important historical timelines are to me. It helps folks put things in perspective. So if we go back to the years 500 to 1000 in Genoa, we know that period is often referred to as the Dark Ages in England and other European countries. Would you say it was also a Dark Age for Genoa and Italy in general? <laughs> That's a good, a good question. You know, it depends what you mean by dark. I don't think it was as dark as, as we've always wanted to make it out. Obviously, we had a situation in which a great society, you know, the Roman Empire, which had reached levels of sophistication, of architecture, of, of law, and, and populace. You know, I mean, Rome, at a certain point during the Augustan age, had reached a million inhabitants. So definitely we have a period in which there was a going back. That level of sophistication was no longer possible. I mean, you, they know in Italy, they no longer had the engineers that could fix the roads, that could fix the aqueducts. They would just sort of show up and look at them and just not know how to fix these things. Then, you know, with the Lombard invasion, like I said, we had, again, air quotes, barbarian people coming in with no written laws, just oral laws, and ruling the country for so long. So I suppose in that sense, you could say it was a sort of dark age, but that doesn't mean, you know, nobody was studying, nobody was finding new ways to do things, knowledge uh, was still there, but definitely it was a step back compared to what had been reached during the Roman Empire. When you mention the Lombards and the Franks, what comes to mind for me is the Italian modern region or province of Lombardy, and the Franks remind me of Charlemagne. How do you connect those two? Charlemagne was the man who defeated the last Lombard king. So basically it was Charlemagne's father, Pepin, who was called in by the Pope to ask for protection from the Lombards. Because anybody in Italy who is looking to conquer the whole of the peninsula is eventually going to clash with the Pope. And the Pope was always looking out for his state making sure that whoever was around him wouldn't eventually try to take his state under their influence. And that was what hap was happening with the Lombards. Despite the fact, interestingly, that if you wanted to find a first step on the way to the creation of the papal states, it was actually the Lombards who did it. I mean, one of the first steps. And that was the so-called donation of Sutri. What happened was that the king, the Lombard king at the time, Lutprand had taken the city of Sutri, which had been still under Byzantine influence. Because we must remember that although the Lombards defeated the Byzantines, the influence of the Byzantines in many coastal areas was still very strong for, for a long time. So King Lutprand of the Lombards took the city of Sutri from the Byzantines, but when it was time to give it back, he didn't give it back to the Byzantines, but directly to the Pope. So it was basically the first time in history that officially, because then there was a whole donation of Constantine business, which was a big fake, but it was the first time in official history that a king was giving land to the Pope. So that's how you tie in Charlemagne and the Lombards. Basically, the Franks were the ones that came in and booted out some of the Lombards, because then many of the Lombards who were never really into being united behind one king stayed on. And indeed, many important Italian families of the later centuries would trace their lineage back to the Lombards. And basically, uh, for a long, long time, whenever Italians themselves and also other Europeans would refer to the Italians as the Lombards, even in the time of Dante Alighieri, for example. And today, one of the 20 regions I mentioned before is the region of Lombardy. And the, the seat, the regional seat of Lombardy is the city of Milan. Mike, could you describe the Genoa of the mid-15th century when Columbus was born in 1451? So first of all, when we say Genova in, uh, in 1451, we don't mean just the city of Genova, but we mean a sort of, like we said before, a mini empire, more of an economic and trade empire than an actual political empire, but nevertheless an empire which would have included Corsica, parts of Sardinia, colonies all around the Mediterranean, and so on. 
And Genova was divided, like many cities, with internal divisions, with families lining up on either side. The, main, the most important families at the time were those of the Adorno and the Campo Fregaso, or, or just Fregaso families. And like in many Italian cities, those internal divisions would line up with external divisions. So, for example, the Fregaso were in line with the Anjou, and the Adorno would have been more in line with the Aragonese. Uh, for example, Domenico Colombo, Cristoforo Colombo's father, would have been a member of the Fregaso faction, let's say. And in this period, like Columbus later would, Genoa was already looking away from the Mediterranean towards the Atlantic. That was because the growing influence of the Turks in the east meant that the Italian city-states were being pushed out of that area. And so Geneva had already started experimenting with routes going out of the Mediterranean, going to Portugal, going to Flanders, going to England, and so moving away from the Mediterranean at that time. Christopher Columbus's father, Domenico, was, uh, I said, involved with the Fregazo, and they had also assigned him the control of a tower inside the city, and that's how we know more or less where we can identify Columbus's birthplace. And it's interesting also to a quick consideration on, on Italy at that time, because, you know, when you think of all of the greatness of Italy that you see in films and books and video games, etc., this was the time, because we must remember that Christopher Columbus was a very similar age, for example, to Leonardo da Vinci. He was a very similar age to Lawrence, the magnificent Lorenzo il Magnifico. Machiavelli would be born just 18 years after Columbus. When Columbus was going back and forth across the Atlantic, that was when we saw the rise and fall of the Borgias. And then when Columbus started getting the idea of moving towards the Atlantic and exploring the Atlantic, a certain little artist known as Michelangelo was born as well. So that's the time in which, you know, we can place Columbus and his Genoa. The facts surrounding the early life of Columbus are vague and shrouded in legend and mystery. What can you definitively tell us about his birth and youth spent in this Italian seaport? Well, we mentioned before that his father uh, was called Domenico, Domenico Colombo, obviously. He was a wool merchant and later innkeeper, but he never stopped being a wool merchant. His mother was a woman by the name of Susanna Fontana Rossa, Red Fountain. That means not that it's particularly important, but amusing, let's say. So uh, he was definitely born in Genova. It's not 100% sure whether he was actually born in sort of, when we say the historical center of a city, we usually mean the Roman center of a city. So he was either born in an area called Olivella, which is where they had the house, or he may have been born at his grandfather's house in a place called Quinto, which means fifth, because it was a fifth mile away from Genova. So in one of those two places. He would have studied at the School of Woolmakers because in Genoa, like in many other cities, Florence, Venice, for example, a lot of the daily life would have been controlled by the corporations or guilds, if you will. So he would have studied in the Woolmakers Guilds or the Wool Merchants Guild. He would have studied religion, arithmetic, geography, and the basics of nautical science. And interestingly, he would have studied in Genoese not Italian. He probably would have learned Italian later on in life when he started to have contact with other, let's say, Italians. Then you have to define what Italian would have meant back then, even so now, probably. But then he would have spoken at school in Genoese, but writing and reading probably in Latin, obviously not the Latin of, of Cicero or Caesar, but it would have been a, a, a Latin of the Middle Ages of the church and of the official documents of Genova. Then we know that later in life, he would have communicated principally in Spanish. Indeed, his great idea of, you know, searching for the East going West was something, his, his slogan was in Spanish, you know, he'd say, buscar el levante per el ponente. So, to, to look for the, the east going west, basically. But yeah, his early life, he would have spoken Genoese. And I, I mentioned that because I'm a, a bit of a training as a linguist as well. So I'm always wondering what, what languages these people would have spoken. As a teenager, he would have started uh, moving around on, on boats because his father's business would have required him to accompany his father on uh, trade journeys. And basically then, uh, as the fortunes of the Fregaso faction declined, probably around 1467, Domenico Colombo moved to Savona, which is another city in, uh, in the area of Liguria, where he would have opened an inn, still 
continuing with his uh, wool merchants business. And that's probably where Cristoforo Colombo decided that staying inside an inn was not for him. And he made the great decision that he would become a sailor and an explorer. Once he embarked on his career, did he ever go back to visit or reside in Genoa during his lifetime? That I, I can't answer correctly because I'm not sure. Now, the first document in which Christopher Columbus uh, officially appears is a document from 1473 in which he appears alongside his father and, and in a notary document. We know his father had great interest in the area because Domenico Colombo appears in no less than 67 notary documents at the time. And we also have what we consider the last documented presence on the 25th of August, 1479. So he would have been around 27, 28 at the time, depending on where exactly you place his birthday. And that would have been the last recorded official presence of Christopher Columbus in the area. We don't know if he did return after that. Interestingly, he wouldn't really have missed Genova because one of the reasons he actually ended up in Spain, so Seville and Cordova, would not only be looking you know, towards the, 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 um, the Spanish royal couple for his idea, but also because there was an important community of Genoese in that area. If he never went back to Genova, in any case, he did find a sort of Genova abroad. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Join us next time for the final part of this special conversation. Please consider supporting our History of North America series in the following ways. Join our growing community on Patreon. We offer lots of membership benefits, including artworks and books. Receive an ebook welcome gift upon joining. Donate with PayPal and also receive an ebook. I've written many historical nonfiction and fiction books, including exciting international historical mystery and suspense thrillers. One such novel, the Maesta Panels is set in beautiful Italy, the birthplace of Genoese explorer Christopher Columbus. All my books are available in print and digital format on Amazon. If you shop Amazon for books or anything else, make sure to use our free link so Amazon knows who sent you, thereby giving us extra credit with no supplemental cost to you. All links appear in this show's description and on our website at markvinet.com. Spread the word to family and friends. And remember, all positive ratings, reviews, feedback, and comments are appreciated. This helps us expand our audience. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride.